Uh, good day, welcome back. Our next speaker is Jan Schmidt, and he is talking on room scale tracking with the Oculus Rift in Open HMD. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Jan. I normally, when I come to LCA and give a, a talk, I'm giving a talk about something that is GStreamer related, um, you, you know, because I, I work on that multimedia framework for my day job. Uh, this is not a GStreamer talk. This is about a, my side hack, um, which is based around the, the fact that a couple of years ago when Oculus released the first version, the first consumer version of their VR headset, that's Oculus, that's now owned by Facebook, uh, I got a, a Rift and I used it in Windows, but Oculus at the time, or when they were doing the developer kits, they were working on Linux support and they had a Linux SDK that fell by the wayside and they stopped talking about Linux support. Um, so at some point, we have to start rolling our own if I want to make use of this hardware that I own on the machines that I use regularly. Uh, so I'll do a, a little bit of background about VR, the status of VR on on Linux, but I want to, um, this is not that talk, this is not a general VR talk, I won't be putting on my VR headset and wearing it for your entertainment or showing off you know, capabilities of VR on Linux, this is about reverse engineering my Oculus Rift, it's a, a technical dive talk, but um, a lot of people go, oh I didn't even know we could do VR on, on Linux, and um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on the on the status there, which is kind of cool and exciting because there is a lot happening in the VR space in the open and free world. Uh, there are the project, there is the project that I'm talking about that I'm involved with, the Open HMD project, which is a library stack that aims to provide driver backends for a bunch of VR hardware. So there are um, HTC, there are Vive, drivers for that, there are drivers for trackers like the, the Nolo VR tracker, there's a, an Android uh, renderer and it's cross-platform so it runs on, on the BSDs and on Linux and on Windows as a generic target for enabling HMD hardware into applications. And then on above that there are higher layers that are becoming available, um, there's a, the OpenXR standard that's from Kronos as the equivalent of OpenGL for doing XR, which is augmented reality, virtual reality, the term for that, that combination. So OpenXR is the set of APIs that applications can target as a standard, the same way that graphics apps have been able to target OpenGL and now Vulkan. And for Linux, we have the Monado project that is an implementation of that OpenXR standard and that's really neat. So now we have an implementation on Linux of a standard API that is the same API that is being made available on Windows and applications have a cross-platform target. And then on top of that, we have projects like Steam VR that can target Monado and OpenHMD as their backends. And suddenly you're opened up all the games on Steam that run on Linux that work with the Vive using their proprietary API API and SDK now work with a general set of headsets that we have support for. So, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving world, but there is a lot more that you can do right now than a lot of people realize. So, I, I want to talk about OpenHMD. Uh, so, OpenHMD, as I said, it's a, it's a driver library. We have backends. Um, for a bunch of hardware, PlayStation VRs, the Deepoons, the Samsung Gear VRs, Microsoft Mixed Reality Glasses, and more coming along all the time. And I am working on the driver support for the Oculus Rift. So, uh, introduce the Oculus Rift. I am talking about the original Oculus Rift CV1, the first consumer version. There have been a couple of other Rift releases um, in the last year, so the, the replacement for this is now the Rift S, and then there are things like the Quest that are standalone VR headsets. 
the, the original release uh, looks like this. If you buy the pack, you get the head-mounted display, the HMD, you get touch controllers, there's also a remote control, a simple remote control with a couple of buttons on it, and two cameras that are sensors. And it, the controllers and the headset have IMU, gyroscope and accelerometer measurement units in there to track your motion of those devices. But um, the problem with just having an IMU is that you can use them to get orientation of a device pretty, pretty well. They can find the gravity vector, so you can always tell what angle the device is being held at, but they tend to drift in the yaw direction. They have no absolute orientation, so they drift around the yaw over time. So if you're standing there holding your controller in VR for 30 minutes, you might find that it's showing your hand pointing backwards doesn't match what, up with what you, you have anymore. And that's especially prominent with the, uh, with the HMD as well. I have a, a different, much cheaper, uh, standalone Android-based VR goggles. And uh, I used them to watch a movie one time. And every 20 minutes or so, I would realize that my neck was craned and I was watching the movie over there. And I have to reset the view back to the middle because of that drift. So the cameras eliminate the drift. The cameras sit there as a fixed unit in the room and watch you play. And then, because they're fixed, they can extract your actual position. Um, I also only talked about rotation. If you want to move around, the accelerometers drift very rapidly for that. In a few seconds, you have started to wildly move from your current position. So they need to be constantly corrected, and the camera gives you that. So the camera gives you what we call the room scale tracking. And in the, the Different vendors have come up with different ways of implementing this room scale tracking. But without it, you can only stand in one spot and look around, and you get drift. With it, you can now move around a space and actually interact with your virtual world in an a intuitive way. In the Rift system, this headset is made out of an infrared transparent black plastic, and dotted around it is a constellation of LEDs that the camera can see and you can't. So the system works like you watch the thing with the camera, you see the, the LEDs, you do some matching and magic, and extract the position and pose of the headset and controllers from those observations, and then you feed that into a a tracking loop and correct the position. Um, the, the newer Rift, the Rift S and the Quest use inside out tracking where they've placed cameras on the headset looking outwards at the world and they are now, as you move around, they are watching the scenery move and figuring out your motion from that and you eliminate the need for the fixed cameras and eliminate some of the need for the room calibration and, and you know, gain a, a whole new set of problems and a new set of capabilities. Uh, but it's a, a very different world to what I'm trying to implement for this Rift, although some of the maths and, and framework that we're implementing overlaps with what will be needed um, if anyone comes along and wants to implement support for the Rift S, which I'm unlikely to buy, because I think it's a uh, Graphics-wise, it's a step backwards from the original Rift. Okay, so step one, room calibration. If you've ever used, if it, does anyone own a Rift? Okay, step one, two, and you've done the room, you've done the Windows setup, so you know this this step. When you first set it up on Windows, it asks you to calibrate the position of your cameras, and you have to go through a little sequence in the app, app where. It gets you to put the cameras in front of, at the front of the scene, w looking forwards towards you, and then you stand there and you hold the controller up in front of your eye and push the button and hold it for a while, and it measures those. It asks you your height, and then it goes, okay, height minus about 10 centimeters, that's the eye level. We see the controller there. We, we can work backwards to our camera 
physical positions and store those as a calibration, as a piece of calibration information. So now, whenever we see something in the camera, we have a, a transformation that gets us to the real world coordinates for that observed object. And if the cameras move, your scene gets messed up. Um, you still have some, you still, you still have working tracking, but your guardian system where it will give you warning when you're getting towards the edges of your play area will no longer be calibrated correctly. Right, so that's the overview of how the Rift system works. Does that make sense? Anyone? Yep, I see some nods. I don't see anyone screaming in confusion. Um, so, at the moment, if you download OpenHMD 0.3, which is the latest release, the features that are in there are support for the head-mounted display being recognized on the USB, read out the IMU information, do the three degrees of freedom tracking that lets you stand in one place and look around, supports the remote control button presses, and knows how to do radio control, the radio commands to talk to the controllers, which I, I, didn't, I didn't explain that part of the system, I guess, which is the controllers are completely wireless, so they transmit everything through the headset and all of the USB traffic from the headset tells you these things. So they're you know, sort of chained off the HMD. So there's, there's a bunch of radio control USB commands you need to do to talk to these which, of course, Oculus didn't volunteer any of that information, so how do we know these things? There's a nice project from Philip Zabel called Uvert, which is his uh, Rift and WMR headset playground, and Philip has done an enormous amount of work siphoning USB traces on Windows and picking the patterns out and looking at what USB commands are sent to the, to the Rift and then I've come along later and joined in on, on some of that. And we have figured out quite a lot of the, the system just from purely from those wire traces, um, which le it, it's led us to all the things we know and all the things we know that we don't know, uh, and possibly some things that we, don't, that we don't know that we don't know that it could be capable of doing, but they're not using. Um, we'd have to start pulling apart the firmware to figure out if there are more capabilities that, that Oculus aren't taking advantage of. But we assume that since the system works in Windows, anything that we see on the wire to talk to the headset is sufficient for us to be able to implement something that works at least as well. Um, all right, so that brings me to the thing that we want to implement, which is adding positional support to the existing OpenHMD code base. And that means adding a, a big chunk of stuff. So the existing top half of the diagram is what exists. We have the HMD, uh, two controllers, feeding us IMU data on the red lines that go through a fusion algorithm to tie together the accelerometer information and the gyroscopic rotational information. And that gives us out some readouts that we report to the application as well as all the button presses and things, but this is about the tracking. Okay, so let's look at the fusion first. So IMU fusion, you have two sensors running in each of these devices. You have an accelerometer that gives you acceleration in an X, Y, and a Z axis, and you have a gyroscope that is measuring angular rotation around each of those axes. And the fusion algorithm's job is to bind together those pieces of information to extract the absolute orientation of the, the IMU as well as possible. For anyone that's used an IMU before, you also see these nine degree of freedom ones that might have a, a magnetometer in there, and you might also get barometers in there to um, measure your atmospheric pressure and get an altitude out of that. But, and, and in fact, the developer versions of the Oculus Rift had a magnetometer 
in there as well. And the benefit of a magnetometer is you can measure the Earth's magnetic field, which helps you to get rid of that yaw problem because now you can get an actual north compass heading out of things. However, for a device that's operating indoors near large pieces of metal, um, the magnetometer in an IMU gets easily confused and you're, the, you get these iron effects of your magnetic heading gets disrupted. And so as you move around your play area, you might be finding that it's measuring north in different angles, which is, you know, you're moving sideways, but you get drawn around a corner as you go. So we found they stopped using the magnetometer. Uh, you don't need it when you've got a camera tracking system. And um, eliminated it completely in the, the CV1. Uh, I mentioned they drift over time, the rotation the drifts slowly, the position drifts rapidly. And the reason they drift is that they have small offset errors um, in you know, the accelerometer when you're holding it exactly steady. It should be measuring exactly the acceleration of gravity uh, in some direction. And as you rotate it, that, that vector changes. However, even if it were in free fall, they don't quite measure zero. You have some small offsets on each axis and you can calibrate those out, but, but they are subject to temperature variations. So as you try it in a different environment, you'll still have those bias errors present. And because you take acceleration and you integrate it to get velocity and then you integrate it again to get position, those small bias errors add up rapidly through that double integration. The gyroscope, you're doing less uh, integration because you're only, you're dealing with angular velocity, but you still end up with those, um, those bias errors and the drift. But so we have an existing fusion algorithm, but it, and it works pretty well for extracting the, po the pose of, the, of a, one of these objects. So we are adding inputs from the cameras. So what does a camera look like for the Oculus Rift? They are pretty much a, a UVC camera. You plug them in, you'll see a UVC camera, um, but they have some quirks. Uh, in particular, they announced that they are a UV, a, a, um, UVYV color camera at half the width of what they actually are and you have to ignore what the camera says it is giving you and interpret the frame as a um, 1280 by 960 grayscale infrared image. They're, the firmware reports for, on the UVC descriptors are just wrong. Yep. Um, they have some extra extensions to let you talk to the radio that is in there as well. So they're not, as well as a UVC camera, they have some extra U USB endpoints for you to talk to, to do that. Uh, but you get that stuff done, and what you get out is a 52.0833 frame per second um, capture that is synchronized to a radio signal from the headset. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, you get a frame every 19.2 milliseconds, so you have a window when, as you're doing this processing, that's, that's your deadline. You've got to get your CV stuff done that quickly or you might miss the next frame, so that's, that's pretty, um, pretty quick. Uh, interestingly, we had a, pro a long-standing problem where you, the Rift comes with two cameras, but we found that if you plug a second one in that Linux would just uh, refuse to let you talk to it. It would say there was not enough USB 3 bandwidth available, um, which was ridiculous. You've got, you know, five gigabits of USB 3 bus available. So um, I ended up getting some hints that if you tweaked a value in the, the kernel and hard coded uh, to say, yes, there is enough bandwidth available, it worked. And I dug into that and found a bug in how the USB stack was processing, you know, calculating what the, what the available bandwidth was, um, 
turns out to be related to power management and trying to turn off the USB device too aggressively. So but that's fixed in 5.4 and, and backported to 5.3, um, which is cool. Now I can run three cameras simultaneously, which the eventual goal is to do a full surround view. Um, talk maybe a bit about why that is later as well. Uh, and wh so we've implemented a capture system that is a UVC implementation um, running. So we, we directly do USB traffic and implement the UVC in user space in order to, get, to implement the quirks and radio discussion stuff. And we have some analysis using OpenCV to try and pick out the pose of the, the headset and the controllers. But if we take too long, that leads to frame missing, and that's a, a bit of a, a problem. Um, it's a wide angle lens, so it has distortion. Um, that's a picture of uh, taken through the, the camera of a chessboard, and you can see the, the barrel distortion there. Uh, we did some calibration on that to verify the values we thought we were reading out of the firmware. So the firmware does report what, it, for individually for each camera, they are factory calibrated and give you information about the uh, focal length, the 715, the center in pixels of this display, and the distortion parameters. Um, so they're factory calibrated against how the CCD has been installed in the unit versus the lens and gives you you know, nice correction values. But there are some more values in the firmware that we don't quite understand, but using the OpenCV fisheye model matches and calibrating manually against this chessboard um, gave us values that were pretty much identical to what we get read out of the firmware, so we're pretty confident that's cool. So we can read images from the camera. Now we need to look, at, look in there for blobs. So we call, it, we call it blob tracking. That's finding the LEDs. And one of the things we need to use OpenCV's pose extraction is to be able to tell it which LED matches which uh, part of the 3D model. So it's nice. Another thing in the firmware is a set of descriptors that say, here are all the LEDs, here are their factory measured physical positions installed in the headset. So we have a set of points. And for each point, they did something clever. They allocated each one a unique ID, and then they make the LEDs blink. So each LED is rapidly blinking out a 10-bit pattern changing once per frame, and because we're synchronized using the radio, we know that we sync and take a f uh, an exposure exactly as the LEDs blink, and the result is that you see them get, either the blink is a brighter or less bright, so you see them pulsing in the video. You, get, you have to match those up against the blink patterns. That gives you the ID of each LED, and now you can give that information to OpenCV to say, here's a bunch of 2D coordinates, here's the 3D coordinates that I have that match up against some of these, and OpenCV will match those up and say, right, well, that means that you're observing this thing at this position with this orientation. And then you take that information, you back project it into any other LEDs that you weren't sure about and label those, and then you go to the next frame and you track and project the, uh, the blobs forward in, in the image retain the IDs and feed it back around. But the controllers don't do this nice blinking thing. Only the headset does. Um, the controllers just have fixed turned on LEDs. So when we see an LED in the picture, we can't know which LED it is in the model. And that's a whole different computing problem that's much harder to solve. Um, and in fact, even with the headset, Oculus in the official drivers don't use blink patterns anymore. So they have come up with a reasonable way to solve the more difficult computing problem, which is called correspondence-free registration, um, or the ab initio pose finder. 
The challenge here is find the pose of an object given the 3D model from just a set of visible points which may or may not match up again. They may be points from, you know, you see some blobs, they could be the blobs from the left controller, the right controller, the HMD, or spurious infrared sources in the house. You, you don't know, so you have to, you know, you can maybe start to see why it's a difficult problem. It's pretty easy for people. You just look at it and you go, right, that's the controller. I could draw a little thing there, but for the computer it's much more challenging. And there, there has been, of course, a bunch of research in that direction. Uh, so we've read a whole lot of papers and we're implementing some of these approaches to try and figure them out. And there are two basic classes of approach to this challenge. The global optimization approach or a hypothesize and test branch of research. Uh, in hypothesize and test, you guess something about, you guess maybe this LED is that point, you do that a few times, and you say, right, I've got four points, I've matched them to four things, let's test if that matches what I think it does, if that, you know, by extracting what that means for the pose. A um, few different papers for implementing that. So with RANSAC, we pick correspondences at random, we use a P3P, uh, algorithm to extract the pose given a couple of LED to point correspondences and then you test the plausibility by saying, right, well that would mean I should see these other LEDs in the picture at these locations. Is that true or not? You do that a lot, you count the inliers. Ransack has the benefit that it can reject reasonable numbers of outliers, so when you have all these other controller blobs in the, the picture, you can reject those pretty well and you refine the pose, but you have to iterate. You have to pick random poses or pick plausible poses and then do this hypothesize and test approach over and over again. There's soft posit, which is one of the classic papers in this area where we pick a starting pose, put the thing in a, virtual, in a 2D projection like that and then use annealing to pull the points towards the visible ones and see if we converge on a correct pose that matches the rest of it. And there's blind P and P, which uses Gaussian mixture models and Kalman filtering to start with rough guesses, but refine plausibility areas in that. We have global optimization, which is uh, the brown paper, globally optimal 2D to 3D registration that separately searches in rotation and translation spaces and uses branch and bound approaches to subdivide the parameter space um, progressively and hopefully home in on a plausible subspace that contains the pose we're looking at. If we do this successfully, then we can look at a single image and extract the headset and controllers from that and then match them up against their poses. And now we, once we know the pose, we have a separate challenge, which is how to keep track of that so that we don't have to do that expensive check. That expensive search can take seconds, so um, much longer than the 19.2 milliseconds that we have available. We're talking seconds of searching in an image to try and solve this, this problem. So you can't afford to do it. Uh, 50 times a second. So once you have locked onto the pose, you have to use the IMUs to interpolate. So you take, you predict, you want to predict across frames. So you take the last confirmed position and you use the relative motion since that moment to try and predict where the position will be in the current frame that you're looking at. And then you project the points into the picture, match them up against LED blobs that you can see in there and you use your correspondence based refinement, your PNP ransack algorithm to lock it back in again. So there is also, there's a limitation here with what the IMU sensor fusion does in OpenHMD at the moment because it doesn't deal with any of this kind of, it doesn't have enough features to support this um, this kind of tracking. Uh, for one, it only tracks the position, the orientation of a unit from, it only does three degrees of freedom tracking. It doesn't interpolate the position because 
it has no expectation that it will be getting feedback and we know that IMUs drift in position very rapidly, so there's, you know, no one's implemented that. Um, it also has this short history of 20 IMU samples. Um, anyone want to guess how long 20 samples gets you in history? No? Well, so the headset's reporting its IMU updates at 1,000 hertz. <laughs> These guys are doing it at 500. Um, so 20 samples doesn't get you very far in history, you know, like only a frame. Um, so if we've taken four or five seconds to search and try and find our correspondences, the headset may have moved a long way since then. By the time we find a correspondent with correspondence, we may have drifted a long way. And there's no point correcting the position so that the person is moved to the correct location in the virtual world four seconds after they've already moved somewhere else. So we need the ability to both um, to do these predictions forward when, you know, take the current IMU, give me a prediction for a time in the future, but also to say, right, well, four seconds ago, they were supposed to be here. Can you please fix it up so that it looks like they were doing that. So one, we need to track the position in the sensor fusion, which I've implemented in local branch. Um, we need to keep a longer replay history so that we can replay all the IMU observations to get back to the current location, but now corrected for having started from a different point a few seconds ago. And uh, I've got some papers that say maybe that's not necessary. There are some clever tricks you can do with Kalman filtering to maintain lagged covariance matrices and then do the correction more trivially or you know, more cleverly than just replaying a chunk of data. Um, however, one of the things that's required for that is to implement Kalman filtering into the, the IMU processing. Um, there is also this uh, class of filtering, the savitsky golay filtering that can be used for doing the predictions um, by taking the short history of uh, accelerations and positions and linear velocities and then using those to fit a polynomial to predict even uh, up to a second into the future where the person is, is maybe going to be because people don't tend to move that rapidly uh, compared to sampling at 52 times a second. You'd be wrong. You'd be wrong about where they will be, but you can get closer than you might think. Okay. So how much of that is working? One, we take OpenHMD 0.3. I took a bunch of code from the Uvert tree from Philip that adds the UVC processing. It adds the synchronization to the radio broadcast to get us frame exposure synchronization. We enable the LED blinking. We have blob watching code to extract blobs from the, the images. We can measure the brightness of each LED. We keep a, set, a window of a bunch of samples and we look at maximum and minimum brightnesses over a window and then pick out the pulsing. We match those up against LED patterns, we read the LED models out of the firmware and we have an the OpenCV integration to do the PNP ransack. Um, I've added support for multiple cameras. The, uh, we, so this is, this, I wrote this slide a, a few months ago. We have improved exposure phase tracking, which is the, the blob blink pattern tracking. We implement the fisheye distortion model to correct the position of LEDs in the picture, and we have the start of a common filter, and we have a soft posit, an implementation of soft posit to do the initial pose finding. Um, and we have this neat development and debugging method. I said this wasn't a GStreamer talk, but I lied. <laughs> so we use Pipewire and GStreamer in our development branch. Has anyone heard of Pipewire? Yep, one, two, a couple of people. So Pipewire is a extension and abstraction of the idea of pulse audio, in a sense, and Jack. 
Um, where those are servers that process audio from multiple applications and, um, you know, they, they, so Pulse Audio provides shared access to a single access device by being a server that controls your sound card and then allows multiple applications to play sound simultaneously. Pulse Audio will mix it. Jack uh, is a system that musicians use for taking audio that is being played in applications and processing it through a, a graph that is passed from process to process and then doing something with the result which might be to spit it out a sound card. Pipewire abstracts that idea to a general multi-process data processing framework. Uh, in particular, it lets you process graphs of video information, much like GStreamer processes graphs of data processing, but Pipewire is designed to do it across multiple processes that join in and request data from each other and then hand results back out on another chain. And it has a whole bunch of cool infrastructure there for efficiently passing video data large, you know, video data's large. You don't want to do it inefficiently. You certainly don't want to stuff pixels in a, uh, I, I, a normal socket and then expect that you'll get any kind of performance. So it knows how to do DMA buff transfers and, and performant transfer of video. It's really cool. It's also, in the Wayland world, the way that you will do screen capture because in Wayland, applications don't have access to pixels on the screen like you do in the X server. So if you want to record the screen, you need to ask Wayland to give you pixels. And in upstream Wayland, they've got pipe wire support for that as the mechanism to get video frames off your screen out where you can record them. Nice thing about doing it that way is as well as you can add policy for access control so that Wayland can pop up and say, hey, this application wants to record your screen, which you just can't do in X. So I'm a big fan. What am I using it for in OpenHMD? So I have an OpenHMD application that's doing VR and I, in that, am capturing video from a camera and doing processing on it. I can use Pipewire to publish that camera feed as a video source and then I can use GStreamer on the, uh, as a client to view those streams so I can have any running application and I can connect to it to view debug output from what the video processing is doing for the tracking. I can also use GStreamer to record the video stream and I'm also using Pipewire to spit out a, a stream of JSON information along on a, on a parallel pipe with timestamps that are correlated so that for each video frame I have a JSON blob that says what was the exposure phase and what was the IMU re reporting at that point and now I can record a full session of video data and IMU information to a file and replay it later to test out different algorithms not in real time and you know you can see the benefits hopefully. Um, I can use Pipewire's frame buffer pool to do capture and zero copy transfer for that, which is kind of neat. Um, so we got that much. What's missing? We don't do any room calibration. I'm mostly working with one camera right now, so I just, I don't have that. Here's a camera, here's a camera. We calibrate them to positions and do a transfer, transform to world position. I'm, I'm just one camera, do a transform for some arbitrary world transform right now. And we can't really do the blink-free or ab initio correspondence matching. It's, you know, we're, we're working on that most intensively. And we don't have a, a bunch of stuff that you would ideally want in a generalized framework like this, which is the uh, device synchronization and firmware update pieces. So I've got time for some quick demos. Um, that's the end of my slide, so I'll get this out of the way. And then I have a couple of terminals open over there. Um, so if I go here, I do build, open. Okay, then over here on this screen, I have this guy, which you don't need to see. That's just, if I pick up the headset and look around, it's got a OpenGL scene running. And then you can see because of the video processing that we're doing, 
we're losing a bunch of frames. Um, over here, I can use the GStreamer device monitor and I can grep out the feed, the video feed that I'm using, and then I can use a PipeWire source plugin. Um, I have to update it for the path that it's popped up on each time. Um, I've got a, my, my GStreamer plugin that simulates the video processing that is happening in OpenHMD and draws debug information over the top and then output it on a, a GL video window, which is that one. And you can see that the camera's here, it's pointing over this way, but because of its field of view, it can actually see the rift out there at that angle. If I move it a bit closer, it'll see it even better. And you can see that as I cover the LEDs, they come up as purple, and then as they're identified, they turn green, and then we draw red dots where we're tracking the thing to be. So you can see the tracking goes crazy when it fails to do the correspondence correctly, but when it locks in, that's, that's pretty cool. Nice. That, so that's, that's the blink pattern tracking. If I turn on the controller, you see it there, it's not blinking, but we do still get a couple of green LEDs because one of the blink patterns is a 0x1, so if we get even any brightness change, we start to think that's LED1. It's not so good. But that's demo number one. Um, so that is good enough that if I, if I brought this back to the front, um, bring the, this back to the front, then when we lock in and we, when, when we get a good pose match, we match up the LEDs and we say, right, we've locked the pose, then we, we don't do any good filtering with that information, but we do brutally update the position of the person in VR. And because there's jitter in that, you start to get shaken around like you're on a vibration platform. So that, but until we have filtering in place for that, it's, um, it's going to continue to be horrible, but it does let us see that it is working, it's locking, and I can move side to side um, to do that. I can still look around, but I can, I can move side to side while it's locked in on that tracking. Um, the second demo that I wanted to do that I'll be super quick with here is in the soft posit tree. I have the, I have the soft posit ab initio finding under development code. Um, it's popped up the same window over here, but that's not the interesting window. What's interesting for this one is to just do get rid of get rid of the filtering, draw this straight up like that, and now this is going to, um, is hopefully see it do a little search thing. I didn't test this very well. No. It's not going to do my search for me. So the debug, the, the visualization here is that it draws a little, uh, uh, um, visualization of all of the search patterns that it runs and how they're homing in on the LEDs. Um, but I was fiddling with the code 10 minutes before my talk, so, you know, usual. <laughs> I'll put up a video. Anyway. So that's the bird's eye overview of the development work that we're doing, and I am out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
because it, because of the nature of the way we're viewing this and the, the fact that your half your LEDs are occluded at any point around the back of the device, it just doesn't seem to home in on the pose very well. So I think we've got to get that working. Then we could look at GPU acceleration with some um, platform specific backends. <coughs> that, that would be a large departure from what OpenHMD has historically done, which is to be plain C, low level, cross platform. Okay, thanks a lot. Can we all uh, put our hands together and thank Jan for that. Thank you. And we've just got a small gift. Uh, thank you very much.